Hi, so I'd just like to say welcome to those of you who have just joined. Um, this is the 2021 Corpus Christi College Virtual Open Day, and it's the Preparing for Interviews, the Arts and Humanities session. Um, I'm James Davis Warner. I'm the school's liaison officer at Corpus Christi, um, and I will be giving you a short talk about um, the admissions process and um, the interview process. Um, but before I start that, um, I just want to give a chance for our panel to introduce themselves. So if I could please start with um, Jasmine, please. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Jasmine Cooper, and I'm, uh, I'm kind of representing uh, the modern and medieval linguists uh, today. Um, so I'm director of studies in French for the first years. Um, and I'm also a director of studies in MML at um, Downing College. So what this means as a DOS, I kind of look after your academic well-being and make sure that everything that you need academically is looked after. And then I go through things like your reports and all of that sort of academic side of things. Um, so we have quite a lot of contact with one another um, when you're at Cambridge. Um, apart from that, I guess I also teach. I teach 20th and 21st century, uh, 21st century French literature, thought, visual culture. Um, um, my particular interests are intersectional feminisms, critical race theory, queer theory. I work very much in the contemporary, so looking a lot at, at questions of privilege, at how uh, literary and artistic kind of output responds to kind of what's going on in the in the world at the moment. Um, and then, <coughs> excuse me. I think, I think that's all you need to know about me at this stage. Um, but we would ask to recommend to you something that we might, um, might we would recommend you bring to Cambridge. And I had a, a big think back to when I was an undergraduate uh, at Cambridge. And I think that there were a couple of things. One was bring your own pillow, which it, the college provide lovely pillows, but there is something about having your own pillow. Um, don't just don't bother with bringing loads of heavy things. And I guess the other thing is um, don't bother with candles. You're not allowed to light them. Um, bring some Tupperware. It's quite like a, a mom thing to say, but it's really useful. Um, and yeah, I think that would kind of be my recommendation. So yeah, I hope I did that all, all okay, James. I hope that wasn't like, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, and if I could go to Emma, please, next. Right, hello. Well, my name is Dr. Emma Sperry. I'm a director of studies in history at the college, so I do much the same kind of thing as Jasmine. That is to say, um, I, uh, as it were, I'm in charge of academic progress for the students that I look after. I direct studies for the second year students, um, and it's essentially very much the same thing as Jasmine just described. Um, I'm a fellow at the college in history as well, and uh, my specialist area is 18th century France and Europe, uh, including the colonies. So I work on projects like, um, at the moment I'm working on a project concerning drug taking in the period of Louis XIV, Louis XIV. Um, and uh, so I have a, a lot to do with interesting substances, as it were. Um, I was also asked to suggest something that you might bring to Cambridge. And I thought to myself, well, I have a 19 year old son. And if I asked him this question or made suggestions as to what he could bring, he would be absolutely livid. So I'm not actually going to do that because I think you're old enough and sensible enough to make your own decisions about what to bring. I suppose if you wanted to bring something that would be interesting, why not a diary? Because Actually, as a historian, I know how interesting it is when we read diaries of people, particularly students, um, and they are often absolutely vital sources in recording what everyday life at university is really like. So you could think about that. Thank you, Emma. Um, and then uh, last but not least, Jonathan, please. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, my name is Jonathan Morgan. I'm the Director of Studies in Law at the College. Um, I'm a fellow of Corpus. I'm also a reader in English law uh, in the university. Um, so I give lectures, teach undergraduates in the college uh, and research in, in law. Um, I, my areas of expertise include commercial law, um, some aspects of constitutional law. So for example, I'm currently, in fact, this morning going to be writing something um, about a bill that's currently before Parliament for reform of uh, judicial review. 
and most of my time at the moment though is occupied writing a book about civil wrongs or torts which uh, which is a subject that everyone studies in in the first year here so I, i'm the director of studies uh, for all three years of of the course at corpus um, and i would be one of the the interviewers that you'd meet um, if you came uh, came apply to this college for admissions um, on the question of what you should bring to cambridge uh, I, i'm baffled as to what to recommend uh, like my colleagues but if i think back to to my own student days a quarter of a century ago uh, one of the most popular boys in in, in my year had a, a coffee grinder uh, and this was enormously fascinating to everybody. And in Cambridge Market, there's a, a stall that sells coffee beans. So uh, if you're at all interested in being caffeinated, and uh, for me, uh, it's absolutely essential part of my mornings, perhaps if you get your own coffee grinder, that would allow you to uh, start the day both energetically and uh, full of coffee. Um, so obviously that's, that's tongue in cheek, and I'm sure there are much more practical suggestions, but uh, you might like to think about that. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Um, lovely. I will now, um, I should now hopefully be able to share my screen. Um, and I'm now going to give us a short presentation on, uh, yeah, preparing for interviews for arts and humanities. Um, so just before I start, I want to tell you a little bit about Corpus Christi College. There might be some of you who've done some research. There might be some of you who know nothing about um, Corpus Christi, but we were founded in 1352 by the townspeople of Cambridge, and uh, we are unique for that. Um, we're a small size, so we take around 300 undergraduates uh, a year. Just for comparison, somewhere like uh, Jesus or Trinity or St. John's can take uh, upwards of 180. Um, so we're quite small, we take about 90 a year. Uh, we're a central location, um, but the main college is centrally located as well as all of our undergraduate accommodation. Uh, most of our students would say that um, nothing is more than 15 minutes walk away if you're uh, at Corpus. Um, we also guarantee co college accommodation for the entire length of your course here. So you will always have the ability, um, or you always have the opportunity to take a college room. Um, I would also recommend that because it's a lot cheaper than privately renting um, in Cambridge. Um, we have a 24 hour student library, um, which is exclusive for Corpus students. And as, in addition to that, we have the world famous Parker Library. Um, certainly if you, we've got any um, ASNAC students out there or um, any um, historians who are um, with us today, you might find yourself using that. It's a fantastic uh, resource to have right on your doorstep. Um, the college itself has excellent music, drama and sports facilities. Um, there's the Leckhampton site, which is about, again, a 15 minute walk away. And there you have got, um, there's squash courts, there's a gym, there's tennis courts, there's the rugby pitch, the football pitch, the cricket pitch. Um, and then there is also about 10 acres of wildflower meadows uh, which at the bottom is your own private outdoor swimming pool. So we're one of only two colleges to have their own private outdoor swimming pool. Um, within Corpus itself, there are over 40 different uh, Corpus clubs and societies, ranging from your traditional sports societies right up to um, there's a cheese and wine society, there's a filmmaking society, um, there is also a climbing society. Yes, yeah, so there's lots going on um, specifically for Corpus students. Um, we also have the Corpus Challenge. That's where we um, engage in an annual battle with our sister college uh, in Oxford called Corpus Christi. We alternate venues um, and that's yeah, a fantastic day. Um, I think we won the last one, which is always good to know. Um, and then finally, um, we have the Corpus Bridging course. Um, and again, this is unique to us amongst all the other colleges at Cambridge. Um, it's a course which is, um, to help broaden access and participation at Corpus, and if you are, uh, if you get, if you're successful in getting an offer made to you after the interview process, and you meet various widening participation uh, criteria, um, you come to Corpus for um, just over two weeks. Um, we help you adjust to, um, yeah, being at university, getting used to the supervision system, uh, and just generally helping you um, get acclimatized. Uh, to the college and to how Cambridge operates. Um, yeah, and that's uh, unique to us. We're the only college that does that. Um, we generally have between uh, 14 and 16 students per year who come on the bridging course, um, which is held, as I said, in September. Um, so how is your application assessed? So Cambridge and course, Corpus, we really stress that we assess all applications holistically. So as you can see in that list there, we try and review everything that we can get from you and that comes as a package. 
Um, so it's not like we give undue weight into one certain thing. And it's not like, for example, if you have an interview that went very badly, that doesn't necessarily mean that you won't get a place. So we try and view, um, we try and build up, you know, an academic picture of you as the applicant. And we try and have all this information view in context. And it's worth also saying that um, that context is very important. And certainly if there are any um, uh, extenuating circumstances, we strongly encourage you to make sure that you notify us of them. You have the extenuating circumstances form as part of your UCAS reference. Um, and also your teachers in their own reference can flag that. So that is important to also stress that. Um, well, what are we looking for? So uh, ability and potential, um, yeah, an inquiring mind, intellectual flexibility, you know, and of course the ability to think critically and analytically, motivation and suitability, you know, genuine personal interest. Um, is this someone who is really gonna thrive you know, it's a lot of hard work at Cambridge, um, and I'm sure um, our panel could talk more about that. But, you know, if it's if you're committed and you're enthusiastic about it, it's not it doesn't feel like work. Or I, I would say it doesn't feel like work. And then also commitment and organisation. You know, they, we're looking for people who are able to work independently um, and don't need um, and who are motivated, um, you know, to put in the work which is required to be a success at Cambridge. Um, so the interviews. So. The interviews mimic the supervision based teaching style at Cambridge, um, and I think the most important thing I would probably stress there is what's in bold is a test of how you think and respond, um, but not necessarily a test of knowledge. Um, and then we've got some like, nuts and bolts here, like last year, the interviews will be held virtually, um, and I also think um, the other thing is like, um, about the pooling system, for those of you that don't know about um, the pool system, if for example, uh, you applied for history, um, but unfortunately you were in a very strong cohort and we weren't able to offer you a place. But someone like um, Dr. Um, Sperry was able, thought you were you deserved to come um, to Cambridge. We would put you in the pool for another college to select, um, select you from. Uh, in the vast majority of cases, you are not expected to have another interview if you are selected by another college from the pool. Um, and then just to follow up, so in terms of actually what happens in the interview, um, it is, you know, broadly based around discussion based on your academic interests mentioned in uh, your personal statement. Um, again, depending on um, who is interviewing you, what subjects you might be asked to look at an extract or a source or possibly, um, you know, if you're a law, you might be asked to look at, you know, some uh, an actual written law. Um, submit and work can be used as a jumping off point for wider discussion and um, again that's if you've been asked to submit it um, and I'd also stress as well um, that fourth point which is there are no set interview patterns you know there's no formula to how um, the director of studies approach the interviews I mean it will largely be shaped by the discussion that you know you're contributing to and also I always include the last one if I'm ever talking um, to students I think there is sometimes people feel like uh, the, the tutors are out there to try and trick you and make you feel stupid, but they're absolutely not. They're just trying to provide an environment where you can display, um, you know, your academic ability to the best, um, to, you know, give you the best chance to do so. Um, so how to prepare. Um, so there's an interesting, well, a checklist there. I, I would certainly, um, I would draw your attention to point three. Um, Definitely, if you are able to and you have the facilities to use a wired internet connection, it is uh, just far more stable than a Wi-Fi connection. Um, I'm sure all of you over the last 18 months who have had um, online classes, you can uh, testify to how patchy Wi-Fi can be sometimes. And I'd also say as well, um, the point underneath that, to continue to, continue, no, continue to engage with super curricular materials is important. Um, and I'll probably talk about that. Um, a little bit more in a second. So yes, continuing with supercurricular engagement. I think probably I would argue the most important point that I have put up there would be, um, I think probably for me, the third one, which was it will continue to develop your understanding of your subject as well as your knowledge base. And certainly that is part and process. Um, and you know, the, the panel can talk more at length about the, the you know, they're the experts on this, but part and parcel of certainly, for example, being a historian is you should be reviewing, you know, you should be reviewing um, the things that you study, the things that you think all the time. And, you know, if you read something new, we read something that challenges what you have previously thought, that's an important part of study at Cambridge and that's an, an important part of the academic world. So, yeah, please don't view all of your super curricular stuff that you've been doing for your admissions to stop 
after um, the 15th of October. I would strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to keep on, um, yeah, keep on reading and thinking and engaging with the things that really grab your interest. Um, so answering questions. Um, I would almost certainly say uh, the most important thing here is for me, I would definitely say, <laughs> yeah, the first one, listen and take time to think. Um, it's absolutely not a race to give the correct answer. Um, obviously, you will all be a bit nervous and, um, you know, that's natural to be. And when one is nervous, one will tend to, you know, possibly rush or not give oneself the time to think. But I think that's really important. Um, and I would also actually highlight as well, ask for clarification. If you mishear the answer, oh, sorry, if you mishear the question that you've been asked or you've missed it or you're just not sure of what has been asked, please ask your interviewer to rephrase it or to repeat the question. Um, I think that's really important. Don't try and sort of guess at what you think they've asked. Um, so always ask for, for clarification. Um, and again, I think the last bit, you know, what matters is content and not style, you know, similar to what we originally said about um, it's not a test of knowledge, it's a test of um, how you think and how you react to new information um, and how you sort of tackle interesting questions. So yeah, you don't necessarily have to be the most gregarious or confident person in an interview because ultimately what matters is what you're saying, not necessarily how you're saying it. So I've, that's me done. I've really sort of rattled through that. Um, so I will now open or throw up um, some questions to the panel, if I can just stop sharing there. So everyone should come back to me. Um, Ellie, have we got our first question for any of um, our panel? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Ellie, I'm the admissions coordinator here. Uh, I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. Um, there is a Q&A function in this Zoom session. It should just be at the top of your screen. It should just say Q&A. You can go ahead and use that function to ask questions to the panel um, and we'll filter them through and get them answered for you over the course of the next half an hour or so. So if you wanna ask any questions that you have in there, you can anonymize them. Uh, you don't have to, it's completely up to you and we'll, we'll start feeding them up. Okay. Um... Well, I will, uh, there's one here that's just come in, which I will, I think I can ask to all three members of the panel, which is, will there be any act admission assessments held um, at the interviews? Um, so if I go to um, Emma first, please. Right. Um, uh, so I think that uh, the clearest way to explain what happens is that the interviews feed into the process of assessment and admission as a whole. They are one part of a set of things that we do in order to decide whether or not to make an offer to somebody uh, who applies to, to come here. Um, essentially, uh, we do have in many subjects, including history, uh, an admissions test which involves a bit of pre-reading on which you would then have to answer questions during your interview. Um, no one piece of uh, involvement in the interview or the application form is definitive by itself, as I think um, uh, James just explained very clearly. So uh, yes, you'll be assessed at interview, but it will be part of a broader assessment and you may uh, have to uh, do something on the lines of a short test that's, that's um, in college, but all of these kinds of tests are advertised beforehand. They're always in um, the description of what we require. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Emma. Um, would Jonathan or Jasmine like to add anything to that at all? Uh, perhaps if I just um, say that we, there is something called the Cambridge Law Test, and um, I will post in a moment, uh, perhaps in the in, in the chat or the Q and A, um, the the web page which has information about this. So I think rather than try and summarise it here and possibly get some of the details wrong. Uh, suffice to say, as last year, this will be taken remotely um, and and online. I mean, obviously, people aren't going to be in Cambridge. So I think I wouldn't quite describe it as at interview testing um, for that for that reason. Um, but it is something that we um, we do alongside the 
the interview. So that that will be taking place, um, and I will I will post the link uh, the link to that. Um, the only thing I would add, quite like um, Emma and Jonathan have both mentioned, is that you will get an unseen passage for MML um, in one of your um, languages. If you're doing, I'll come on to Ab initio languages, so languages that you're taking from scratch, maybe a little bit later, but there is one part of the interview where you'll have something unseen, but it's not so much a test as it is a kind of way for us to interact with something which you haven't been able to prepare just so you have there's a more organic kind of um, for us so we can see how you organically uh, interact with um with the text and that would be in in um for example french if you were applying for french and spanish that would with me it would be with french in french um but there are all of the other different forms of assessment which happen prior to the interview so on interview day it would only be the unseen um that you would have could, could I just say, I, I have now posted a link in the chat and hopefully everybody can see that. The, the information on that page is actually, well, what it says is the precise details of exactly how and when it will be sat will be notified in, in due course. Um, but the information about what the test is like and how to prepare for it, all of that remains um, the same as it has been for many, many years past. Um, in, in terms of I want to say a little more about law interviews, perhaps, which is that, um, as James said in his presentation, people who have a law interview um, would be given a legal text, which might be a, a judgment of the court, or it might be a, a statute legislation from Parliament, and given a, a short time to read through that and, and think about it. So in, in one sense, the interview is a, a starts at least as a comprehension exercise based on something that you'll just have read. We do not expect any knowledge of law. Most of our applicants don't know anything about law and that's perfectly fine. Uh, a few people might have done A-level law, but I, I would just say um, to anyone who hasn't done A-level law, not, not to worry about that. I mean, th those who've done A-level law don't, aren't at any uh, advantage in the process because we choose areas of law that people haven't studied. Um, at school, so it, it's not it's not something you can prepare for by trying to learn lots of cram lots of knowledge about law, how the courts work, or anything like that. There's no need to to do that. So everything that was emphasised in James's presentation about assessing your potential uh, and and really your your intellectual ability to understand complicated idea and and discuss it with us, and we're not trying to catch anyone out um, and. When, when you say something, we'll question you about it, get you to justify your view, perhaps see if there are counter arguments and how you react to those. Um, but often there's no, it's not a simple question of there's a right or a wrong answer. We're, we're looking for a uh, discussion and an intellectual engagement. Um, so sorry to, to ramble on a bit, but the main thing I wanted to say was Cambridge Law says re read um, the um, link that I posted and then you will know as much as I do about quite how this is going to work because I, I think it's a slightly moving target. Great um, I'd also just add so if you see where Jonathan's put um, the link to the law um, Ellie has just uh, put the link down for uh, more information on all the admissions assessments for all the courses there in the chat so you can access that there. Um, so I have another question so um, whilst candidates get interviewed for joint, um, for joint uh, degrees um, would corpus ever consider them for um, a single honours only? So, for example, if they got interviewed for history and politics, would they be ever offered for history singly? Um, I'll go to Emma, or I'll, I'll go Emma because it mentioned history, and then I can come to, to Jasmine. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, this is actually something that happens. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the, the ordinary outcome, but it, certainly in my experience, since we've had the joint degrees, it's happened a few times. Uh, and sometimes um, the candidate themselves decides that they'd rather do the single honours degree. Yeah, just to add to that, that, um, for example, history and MML um, have a joint honours and we find that sometimes a candidate may do better in, for example, the languages than history. Um, and it is possible for us to make an offer just for the for, to become a languages student rather than history or vice versa. So it does happen. Um, and it's done in kind of 
the student is told if we if we make that offer it's not that we just tell you that that's going to happen kind of have an agreement with you as well but um so it does happen it is possible great thank you um and i think well I'll, I'll put this question out there um someone's asked um is there any differences between how the colleges interview their applicants Well, it, it's quite a hard question to answer, in fact, because um, each college is entitled to make its own arrangements and each director of studies decides what they think the best format is. So uh, there's bound to be some individual variation. So my, my sense is in law that most colleges would do what we do here, which is get people to read a legal passage and, and discuss it um, when, when they um, but the legal passages that are set will, are almost certainly going to be different. It will be very surprising and a sheer coincidence if the passage were, were the same. Um, some colleges, perhaps this is a general point, some colleges have what's known as a general interview, where you're interviewed not by the director of studies or another law fellow, but perhaps by the senior tutor or the admissions tutor and asked much more general questions about your academic interests. And that's something we do not do at Corpus. Uh, I think it's fairly unusual now, but I'm, I, I reckon a few colleges still do this. Um, so that's one thing. And I think if you look at colleges, in each college's information, they will tell you whether you're going to be having that sort of interview. But if you have a general interview at another college, it's not something I think you can prepare for at all. Um, but in corpus, certainly in law, you'll have two interviews, both um, by one of the law fellows accompanied by a colleague and focusing on your legal potential. Great. Um, another one. Um, how many people will I be interviewed by? So I can I can answer this one. Um, the normal format is for somebody to be interviewed by four interviewers uh, acting as pairs. So you'd have two separate interviews of about 20, 25 minutes each. And in each interview, you would encounter two interviewers because that's uh, the best way to get a sense of the, the range of your interests. All of your interviewers would have slightly different areas of specialism so that they would be asking questions from different perspectives. Um, I, I would also add that's why also the interview system is rigorous. You know, you, you're not just relying on one person. I think it's a, it's a really strong part of it. Um, another question. Oh, sorry. Yes, Jasmine. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, just to say with um, MML, one interview is usually for one language and the other interview is usually for your other language so you would have one French and maybe a general chat with me and a colleague and then for your second interview it would be the second language that you're applying for and if that is a language which is ab initio so a new language for you that you've not studied before don't worry you won't be uh, you won't, are not expected to have any language skills so say you're applying for French and then ab initio Italian we would not have any expectation that you would know any Italian it is highly unlikely um, that you would be asked to speak in that language at all there may be some sort of passage that you would be reading related to the culture of the language that you've chosen but that's generally about it so one interview is for one language the other interview is for the other language and generally and maybe a more general interview just to say that that's how it's generally split for mml it might be worth adding a short note about the um, joint degrees as well where the usual practice is for one interview to consist of two interviewers from one of the subjects and the other interview to involve two in interviewers from the other subject. So for example, in history and modern languages, you'd have a pair of interviewers who were historians and another pair who were from MMLL. Thank you, Emma, yeah, that's very important. Um, so another question, um, in your opinion, um, are there any weightings given to each aspect of the application? Um, are they all equal or do you feel that one or two are slightly more important than the others? Um, shall I go to Jonathan first, I think, probably? Well, it's we, we, we do look at um, everything. I, I'd say that um, school grades are, are probably the single most important thing, in, in my view, um, because it, it shows doesn't show whether you're necessarily going to be good, a good lawyer, um, but it shows all the 
some of the skills that James was mentioning uh, about your organisation and your motivation to work. And, uh, and if you can do that at school and do well in your GCSEs and A-levels or whatever exams you're doing, then the chances are that you'll, you'll thrive at university, including, including Cambridge. Um, but, but, but of course, that's not all we look at, not least because most people applying have extremely good grades. So, so we take everything into account. Um, it, it, in my view, the Cambridge Law Test, which is perhaps the most mysterious, or maybe it's the interview, but it might be the most mysterious of the things, uh, that, that's not given, it's not given some great priority, so, so don't worry too much. But I'd say also for myself uh, that personal statements are probably the least important thing. Uh, what, what we find, um, to speak very frankly here, is that um, those whose parents have connections with the legal profession can show off and say, I've met all these high court judges or something like that. Um, but that doesn't get them anywhere. I mean, it's, it's, it's good. I mean, if you're interested in law, by all means, um, go to courts and find out what they do and perhaps do some legal work experience. But you don't have to do it. And if you haven't done it, it doesn't disadvantage you at all. So we read your personal statement, but it's frankly not, I think, going to make any difference to, to whether you get in, whether you have done lots of work experience or not. So that's the least important of the things. Jasmine or Emma, do you have anything to add to that or are you happy with what Jonathan said? I, I would largely agree with what Jonathan has said there. Um, obviously, the, we do give a language test beforehand. And so we do take that um, into consideration, obviously, because you're applying for languages and we need to see a kind of demonstra a demonstrable kind of talent for languages. Um, but we do take a very holistic approach. Um, for, the, for us, the personal statements are not in, are not dependent on how likely you are to get in, but they do form the kind of basis of our interviews with you. We really do ask you about what's in your personal statements. And so it is highly advisable, and you will be told this many, many times, do not lie on your personal <laughs> statement. Do not put anything on there. I have interviewed people and I've asked them a question, simple questions, and you can you just know the minute that they open their mouth that they've not read it. So. If you're wise and you really want to do well at interview, only put stuff on your personal statement that you're actually willing to be asked about and have something kind of, you know, be refreshed before you do the interview. Um, but that's so it's it's not so much like if you've got a winning personal statement, you're in. It's much more that the personal statement is really important for interviewers because it gives us something common, common ground for when you enter that room. So that's what I would just add there. I agree with this completely and nothing is more embarrassing for both sides than to have someone turn up uh, and obviously not really know, either have forgotten what they said or have talked about something which on questioning they, they know very little about, which is slightly embarrassing. But I think in terms of uh, within history, what we think of as the most important aspects of the, the uh, process, uh, the submitted work that you send in is probably one of the main ways that we will evaluate your quality, even beyond, for example, the way that your teachers and your school judge your work, we have a chance to look at it directly and we can therefore tell more or less the standard to which you're working. And that's actually very interesting because um, schools are very, very variable in the ways that they assess and talk about individual uh, applicants. And so we really can't place too much weight on those because, for example, if you come from a big comprehensive, it's obviously much harder for the head teacher to know you personally than if you come from a really small private school. So in other words, we're much more interested in what you say about yourself as a basis for the interview and also in what you can do in terms of writing uh, essays, for example, constructing arguments, um, how you can think your way around problems that you might not have encountered before. And that's what we focus on at the interview. Yeah, all very good. Yes, I agree entirely with what everyone's just said. Yeah, please don't lie. Just be honest. Yeah, you, you, you won't gain anything. I think, you, yeah, you just look like a fool. Um, so another question um, we've got coming in. Um, so if uh, if you do have um, some reading um, to go through before an interview, um, how long will you how long will you usually be given to read it? But if I just leap in and say, certainly for my own interview, you're given half an hour in, immediately before the interview uh, to to read through 
a passage. Uh, of course, you can take notes on it, but you, you will have done it just beforehand, so it should be fresh, fresh in your mind. Um, but, but also sometimes we give people a, a very short text, you know, one, one subsection of a statute, perhaps in the interview, and you'll be given a few minutes to, to read it and then we'll discuss it straight away. So it's not, it's not going to be very far in advance. Uh, I also wanted to say something just to, uh, to, to clarify something about law in the light of what Dr Sperry just said, that we don't ask for schoolwork to be sent. So the Cambridge law test is our, if you like, in law, it replaces written work sent in. So we, we, we don't take that into account in law. We don't ask for it. Um, the passages for MML are very short, and I think it's something like 15 minutes. It's, 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 it's shorter than half an hour, and that is plenty. It's, it's enough time. And um, the passages are pitched at a level which will be appropriate for you. So don't worry. Um, we're not, again, we're not, people often, we're not expecting you to be fluent while you're coming to learn languages, um, is to, to develop those language skills. So it'll be a passage which you will be able to say something about and will be able to understand. And there will be a couple of challenges, but you will have enough time beforehand. Yes, and we follow a very similar um, uh, pattern to law in that we allow people half an hour and there's quite often a choice of, of readings of passages uh, and then we ask you questions on that. Um, uh, there has for the last few years been a history admissions test run by the university. Um, up to that time, we used to do our own brief admissions test, which would involve you answering questions in writing on passages. But now we just ask you questions face to face in the interview. And we give you about half an hour to read the, the document, um, which may include just text or it may be text and images. Um, and then you can often get to choose um, the, the passage or image that you prefer, and we'll ask you about that. I think I'm also correct in saying um, that we're one of the few colleges who doesn't make our history applicants sit the HAA. Is that right? That's right, isn't it, Emma? Yeah. We have relied on uh, HAA in the past. Um, so it's not something that we never do, um, but we, we do um, alter our policy from year to year, depending on, you know, the state of play, basically. Yeah. I should also uh, just flag as well that because every college um, decides its own interview formats, there is, um, they can all specify what they want from you in terms of ass um, assessments. Um, so if you go on your subject page on how to apply, um, you can download sort of a typical entry and typical college um, entry requirements centrally. So you can find out what a college might be after from, and you can compare what colleges are after um, as well. Um, I will ask a question, which I know, I, I think I know the answer, but it'd be worth getting, I think probably your three, uh, your input. Um, can I have a parent or a teacher in the room whilst I'm doing my interview? Don't even have to unmute. Yeah, um, that's good. That's one. Um, and then, um, so here's one actually talking about um, once you have started. So if you've been made a Cambridge offer and you've started, um, are you able to switch courses if um, it's if the course you applied for was not what it's what not what you thought it was going to be? Yes, I can answer this one. Um, yes, there are ways to switch tripos. Um, they are, in fact, quite various depending on the subject. And it's something that you would only be allowed to do following discussions with your director of studies and your tutor. Um, so I can't give you a cast iron rule that, that fits all situations. Um, that is something that depends very much on the particular tripos you're studying and the tripos that you want to move into. Um, but the regulations about how you can change are all always listed by law in the prospectus for the subject that you're interested in studying that the university issues. So those decisions are, uh, the, the rules for them are set by the university, but the decisions are taken uh, within college um, only by agreement with your director of studies and your college tutor. Um, how common would you say it is as well? Gosh, uh, that's hard to answer. I suppose uh, at least within history and history and politics, history and modern languages, we get perhaps one person a year 
Um, I don't think it's hugely common, but it does happen. Um, partly it's not common because it can be a uh, little bit tricky. For example, well, it's probably a concrete example's best. Um, if you were to do history and modern languages and you completed your first year and had a, a part 1A um, exam behind you, you would not be able to switch into history at that point because there are certain papers that uh, run over the two years of the history part one. Uh, and that means that you wouldn't be able to uh, proceed to part uh, the second part of part one uh, because you wouldn't have done that paper in the first year. And conversely, if you were doing history and you finished your first year in that and did your prelims examination, that's not formally an honours examination, which means that you would not then be able to move into HML part 1B because you would have had to have some 1A examination behind you in order to switch to uh, a, a discipline in which the part one is divided into two separate years. So there are very complex circumstances that govern all of these moves. Thank you very much for that, it's very clear. Um, how likely are you to ask about A-level content for students who are applying after a gap, having had a gap year? For, for us, it's what's, in your, it's what's in your personal statement. So we're very much led by you. Um, it, we wouldn't, we start from personal statement and then build out. But if you've had a gap year, it would be wise to re-familiarize yourself with anything that you're stating on your personal statement. Um, but we, we tend to try and move away from the A-level texts. We hope also that students who are interested in studying languages are also kind of looking beyond the horizon of the A-level texts um, um, to showing some sort of where their interests lie. So um, it's much more make sure that you're familiar with the information that you've given us, as, as I said, and um, you can expect to be asked on that, but we're not specifically going, well, what did you think about this from your A-level exam two years ago? We, we definitely don't do that. Uh, perhaps could I say in law, and this actually allows me to answer a slightly different question, which is, are there certain A-levels you, you should choose? Well, it's too late because you're all doing them, but let me say whatever A-levels you're doing, as long as they are you know, crunchy academic subjects, whether it's science, arts, humanities, maths um that they're, they're all equally good preparation for law and for this reason because the people applying have a whole variety of subjects we don't ask them any questions about their a-level subjects and that's including those of you who are currently in the upper sixth and doing their a-levels so we don't ask those people about them and we certainly wouldn't ask someone who's uh, applying during a, a gap year either. great thank you um I'm conscious um, of the time, and I just want to say that if we, if you've asked a question and we haven't answered it, um, then um, Ellie, who I can hear furiously typing behind me, is either probably trying to answer it for you. Um, but if we don't get to you, um, then you can uh, contact us um, if you use uh, the email address admissions at corpus.cam.ac.uk, um, and this you can ask us a question via that way. Um, because I just want to ask one, I think, final question um, for the panel, um, which is what what's the best bit of advice um, that you would give to prepare for an interview? Um, and I'll start with, uh, well, Jonathan's looking very pensive. Um, I'll, I'll pick on Emma. So if, Emma, if you could start us off, please. Oh gosh. Well, um, I would suggest that one of the best things you can do is to read a bit more broadly than your A-level subject um, in the area that you want to study. Uh, because in actual fact, uh, that is a way to convey that you are genuinely enthusiastic about the subject and about coming to corpus, which is one of the main things that we look for. Um, we want people who are very interested in the field as a whole uh, and interested enough to venture outside the beaten track and not put up with the answers that your teachers might have given you or the slightly formulaic way in which A-level teaching in your field is being delivered. 
Um, and so in lots of ways, we're looking, I think, for something slightly different from what A-level exams look for. Uh, A-level exams tend to look for um, a, somebody who can answer a certain number of points and cram them all into a single essay. Whereas the kind of thing that we're looking for is the sort of person who's going to say, well, you know, that's all very well, but what about this particular problem? Or this made me think of such and such an issue which I can't explain, and then go off and hunt for something that will help answer that particular question. So it's really um, what you can do to help yourself is, is to investigate outside the box in which you've been put by the school, right? Um, if you're genuinely interested in your subject, that's the kind of thing that you're likely to do anyway but I'd really encourage that as one of the main things to do. Great, um, could I, oh, Jasmine, please, thank you. That's okay, I, I would just kind of echo everything that um, Dr. Sperry has just said. Um, we really look for people who are genuinely interested in, in, in the kind of language, culture, and thought of the languages which uh, that you're applying for. Um, and, I would totally agree that reading beyond the syllabus that you're given and showing that you're taking initiatives to seek out engagement with different texts, different, different kind of thinkers um, is really, really refreshing for us as well. Um, and is, is also, you know, showing up, telling us a little bit about the sort of person that you are, what your interests are as well. And um, as an interviewer, um, you know, there's nothing more wonderful than meeting a student who demonstrates this genuine interest and, and passion for languages. And it and it sounds like something that you could that lots of people would say, but it really makes a difference seeing that real kind of um, energy behind, you know, why you want to study languages. Um, and that's the stuff that you can't fake in interviews, I don't think, you know, showing that you've put that effort in and we can sense that. Um, and so I would say that that's the best way. Read beyond the syllabus and try and have as much kind of engagement with the kind of the target languages that you're working um, towards um, for, for application. Um, for law, I'm not sure how much you can prepare for the interview. So I, my advice will be what, what to do on, on the day. I, I said earlier, it was a comprehension exercise. And I think I slightly misspoke. And what I should say really is it's a, it's a thinking exercise. What we want to see is how you think. So think hard, take your time, don't rush, engage with the questions, and also don't be afraid to change your mind. I mean, the best of us cha change our minds about problems when presented with uh, convincing evidence to the contrary. I, I get the feeling that sometimes people have been told, you must never, ch once you've given an answer, you must never allow them to uh, knock you off course. But that, that I think would be wrong. I mean, equally, don't, don't always say, yes, I agree with ev everything the interviewer says, even though they're asking a different thing each time or it will seem you, you you're not thinking at all um i've been doing this for over 20 years and the, the perhaps the single biggest problem faced by candidates has been the uh, the nervousness and the anxiety perhaps terror in some cases that an interview brings i mean i've been interviewed for jobs i remember being interviewed at oxford to be an undergraduate there and it's a horrible thing i, I think the online interviews perhaps hopefully have helped a little bit with the stress because you're in a familiar environment. Uh, but the one thing I would like to um, emphasize to pick up something again James said earlier is please test your internet connection uh, and if the answer is to have a wired connection rather than wireless please do that if you can um, because although if, if there are technical problems we can certainly cope with them on the day. The, the most stressful interviews I had and I sense the candidates had were those where there were uh, difficulties with the internet connection so it's a kind of, sounds almost a trivial thing, certainly a prosaic thing, but if, if you're called for an interview at Corpus or any other college, you know, please make sure wherever you're going to be on the day, it might be at home, it might be at school, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, but please make sure the internet is, uh, is not going to drop out. Yes, very wise words. Um, I, if I may also quickly add, I also can just about remember my interview um, back in the depths of time now. Um, and I think the best bit of advice I can give students is, uh, it's easy for me to say this having done it, but I think try to enjoy it. Um, I think just if you can think of it as an opportunity by which, you know, I'm a historian by trade. So if I was lucky enough to sit opposite 
um, Dr. Um, Sperry for 20, 25 minutes to talk about, um, well, uh, yeah, the long 18th century, which is the special research interest. Um, yeah, that's what an amazing opportunity. Um, so I think, I think those who are able to enjoy it will therefore tend to relax a bit of it. The more you're relaxed, the more you're going to better be able to show off, you know, who you are and sort of your academic um, potential. So if you can, easy for me to say, try, please try to enjoy it. Um, well, I'll just give the panel, is there anything else the panel would like to say at all to anybody? Oh, um, yes, I, just, I just really want to make this clear because I still get asked it all the time. We're really not trying to trick you. We really are interested in what you think. We're not, sometimes we might lead you down a path that we hope you might see that there might be a dead end, but we're not trying to trick you. We're really interested in how you think and respond to text. And I just want to say that we, well, certainly in the MML and I think Corpus generally, we're a very friendly college and we are really interested in meeting meeting you and having a lovely exchange. And I just wanted to make that really clear because there's so many myths and legends about the Oxbridge interviews. Um, so you won't be asked like, um, you know, what is a banana or something? You won't be asked that. Um, we, we, <laughs> we're much less original than that. We will be asking you about things that you can prepare. So um, try and let some of that kind of anxiety go and breathe, really breathe just before you come in. And we want you to do well. That's the other thing we, we really do. So just a note, final kind of thing for me, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'd like to extend the thanks on behalf of myself and all of the people who have been participating to say thank you to the panel. Um, really appreciate you giving up um, all your time. Um, I would also just want to flag um, to um, the students who are still watching. There's been quite a few questions about why should I pick Corpus over another college? Um, I would certainly direct you to attend the Student Life uh, webinar, which we're running at uh, from two o'clock, which the sign up for that is still open. And there we can get more into the details about, you know, why you might want to pick Corpus over another college. And um, oh, the reason why we haven't got into that um, to, uh, in this session is because um, the quality of um, your education um, the the way in which you're going to be taught does not vary from college to college. So it's not like, for example, if you come to Corpus, you're going to get, you know, uh, your law degree is going to be taught to you in a far better way. You know, the quality of, um, of how it's delivered is the same across the, across the university. So, you know, you, you shouldn't really be, well, you can't make a decision on where to apply based on that. Um, although the way that someone's laughing in the screen possibly would suggest there might be a difference in how well it's delivered, but that's probably the personal politics. Or, em, em, Emma, would you like to jump in? I was just going to say, we like to think that we are the best. Um, and then suddenly my, my screen came up with a sign saying that um, I'm running out of application memory. So I may suddenly abruptly disappear from your screens in a second. But yes, we like to think we are the best. And, but it's, it's the case that you'll be taught by people from all over Cambridge. You know, you get supervisions where, where you will go off to Girton or to um, King's or whatever it may be to be taught. So you're not just taught within college. But, um, you know, in terms of what we do in college, it's a small environment, uh, a, a very hardworking environment, a very friendly environment. Um, so I think that it's definitely, you know, the best college that, that I know of. And I really warmly invite you to apply. I, I'd love to see you come up on the application list. Great. Well, I think that's a, a lovely place to leave it. Um, Good luck um, with all your applications and you know whatever college you apply. But yeah, to echo uh, what's just said there, yeah, please apply to Corpus. We are we are the best. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, everyone, um, and hope you all have a good day. <laughs>